one of the principal objectives, as you'll recall, of this group is not so much the Saturday lectures, although those have been an integral part almost since the outset, but we're partly raising funds to enable our students to go to various parts of the, the, the Roman world, to go to somewhere around the Mediterranean or to as far away as Britain. Uh, so right from about five years ago now, I think six years ago, uh, we've been able to offer one Roman archaeology travel scholarship each year. Uh, it was very generously provided for a number of years by Don Boyer uh, so that students could apply for up to two and a half thousand dollars, which wouldn't cover all of their expenses, but it would at least get them to the Mediterranean or to Britain. And then at that point, you know, they could actually go and see things, do things, take part in excavation or whatever. We've had quite a number of those over the years now. And as you'll recall, about 18 months ago, uh, as a result of fundraising through this RAG group, you're not least you, you all buying raffle tickets and some very generous uh, donations that we've had from people, uh, individual members of the, the, the group. Uh, we were able to give the university an additional $12,500 to endow a second of these travel scholarships each year. So uh, since last year, we've been able to give two Don Boyer Roman Archaeology Group travel scholarships uh, each year, and that will continue for at least the next four or five years. Uh, we usually ask the recipients uh, who've had one of these to, to give us a, a, a short talk afterwards at some stage. Some of them escape. You know, one of them who got, who, who got a scholarship along with Rebecca last time conveniently got a job on Christmas Island or somewhere like that. I mean, it, it sounded very, very thin, but you know, that's her reason for, for not giving her talk. Uh, Rebecca wasn't able to get quite that far, uh, so we, we, we tracked her down, brought her along here today, and she's very bravely agreed to give you a talk about what she did uh, while she was in, in Rome on her travel scholarship. So without more ado, or rather with a little bit more ado, as I transfer the microphone and arrange the lights, you've got a pocket or a belt or something, you can put that on. Yeah, that should be fine. And then just clip that on some more. Is that all right? You Can you hear me? Please, at the back, if I start to just lean in and not talk very loudly, wave. <laughs> I'll just adjust the lights now. Is that okay? Can you see fine with that? Yeah. Leaving it 50%? Right, so Rebecca's <laughs> going to talk to us about Rome Renewed, the archaeology of appropriation. Thank you, David. Good afternoon. As David said, I'm Rebecca, I'm currently an undergraduate here at UWA. Um, my major's in classical history. Um, and a little over a year ago, I was able to travel to Rome to do a two week summer school, thanks to the very generous grant by David Kennedy, Don Boyer, and the committee of the Don Boyer Archaeological Group Travel Scholarship. Um, it, although it was organised through the Faculty of Architecture, Landscaping and Visual Arts, or ALVA, the course was designed to provide an overview of how the archaeology of ancient Rome inspired architectural and artistic development throughout history. In addition to this, we were also introduced to many issues confronting major European cities when faced with the demands of conserving its archaeological and artistic heritage. For me personally, the impact of Rome is its longevity, due in no small part to the archaeology of appropriation, or the manner in which those seeking to emulate the perceived greatness of ancient Rome deliberately reused or acquisitioned material culture, thus creating new histories. While we know of several Renaissance periods when the art and architecture of ancient Rome received huge amounts of attention from all areas of the arts, on closer examination, it appears to me that this appropriation has been a continual occurrence, often manifesting in the most unlikely places. Moreover, the fascination of Rome is that it still contains layers of evidence detailing this appropriation and revealing an unequalled historic kaleidoscope, from the ruins of classical Rome to its Renaissance and Baroque churches and palaces, from the late 19th century monuments to the new Italian state. Just as a bit of a background, all our lectures took place on site, which included archaeological sites, museums, art galleries and churches. I think we counted 23 churches in two weeks a lot. Uh, there was 21 of us in the group. We were split into two. The group I was with was mainly um, students from outside the ALVA faculty and mature students. I think it was probably to let the quieter ones in the other group speak. Um, we stayed in a converted convent in Trastevere, which was two minutes walk from the Tiber. 
accessing all areas of Rome very easily. So we were just the other side of the Ponte Palatino with the Ponte Rotto in front of it. Um, we walked everywhere. So unless it was pouring down or it was too far, we walked. And we got to see these every day. So we have the Ponte Rotto, Tiber Island, um, Torre de Argentina, which is also known as the Cat Sanctuary, and the Theatre of Marcellus. We began our journey at the Roman Forum, where we discussed how this and other ancient sites had been changed and added to during the classical period. This included discussion regarding the imp imperial fora and how modern urban requirements had not only separated some of these from the main site, but had covered many ancient buildings in between. From the exquisite frescoes in the House of Augustus on the Palatine to the view back over the Forum, it's only when studying these ancient remains that you realise how much has been lost, removed or reused. The blame for this cannot purely be placed on those who came after the classical period. Many Roman emperors, Constantine a prime example, incorporated earlier art and architecture into their own propaganda machine. After all, it was far easier to use what was already there and change it to suit than suffer the costs involved with sourcing new materials and building something from scratch. This is my personal favourite building in the hall of the Roman world, the Pantheon, is also one of the most iconic and best preserved examples of the archaeology of appropriation. This building is the third incarnation of a temple first built by Marcus Agrippa in 27 BC. The original inscription, that's this one here, you can see that, was retained by Hadrian, who rebuilt it completely from scratch um, between around 118 AD and 125. This building, a temple to all the gods, was then in 609 AD appropriated by the Catholic Church and dedicated to the Virgin Mary and all the martyrs. It's in essence still a pantheon, but now with a Christian twist. Its sumptuous golden marble were looted during this period. Thankfully, however, the bronze doors were left and remain in situ. So, I haven't got any of the doors, sorry. <laughs> <coughs> Although partially restored by Pope Benedict, the building has been robbed and restored several times during its history, most notably in the 16th century when the bronze roof tiles were removed to be used in St. Peter's Basilica. However, for the most part, its original interior has been preserved, leaving us a hint of what might have been had other buildings from antiquity survived intact. The transition from the classical era into that of early Christianity in Rome is mirrored in its surviving churches. Two excellent examples are the Basilica of San Clemente and San Nicola in Cacere, where the current churches have incorporated the ruins of Roman structures into their buildings. This was made all the more fascinating as we were able to descend through the layers to see the evidence for ourselves. So this is the Basilica of San Clemente. It was com this particular building was completed around AD 1123 and its quite unassuming exterior in no way prepares you for what you find inside. The marble choir, which is there, and this is a Cosmati style floor, which is a geometric inlay with marble um, created by the Cosmati family, used most extensively in Rome for the decoration of church floors and sometimes bishops' chairs and sometimes walls. Um, this, along with the altar canopy and the stunning 12th century mosaic, are exquisite. However, it is what lies beneath, discovered by a Dominican friar, Father Maluli, in 1857, that captures the imagination. At the lowest level, separated by a narrow street, are the remains of an insula and a mansion built in the late 1st century AD on top of earlier structures destroyed in the Great Fire of 64 AD. Here we find the Mithraeum, which is this here, which is built directly underneath the altars of both surviving latest churches and is actually in the inner courtyard of the Roman insula. From there we can go up to the middle level, which is a 4th century church, which is this one here. Um, these photographs had to be taken from the internet as you're not allowed to take photographs at all in San Clemente. Close scrutiny reveals pillars and archways bricked up by contemporary builders as they recycled the ancient Roman structure into to fortify their church. Frescoes depicting the life of San Clemente and the story of Saint Alexis can be seen on the walls, some of which have been cut in half where the floor of the upper level starts. 
being recycled into the foundations of an early church, itself the foundations of the current basilica, has protected the ancient Roman ruins. Archaeology, which might easily have been destroyed through appropriation, has been preserved, providing us with a rare glimpse of several periods of history. Similarly, San Nicola in Cacere preserves the remains of three ancient Roman temples within its walls. Dedicated to St. Nicholas, a 4th century bishop of Myra, or more commonly Santa Claus, the church itself was first mentioned in documents in the 11th century. But the original church is thought to be much older, probably around the 6th century AD, and the words in carcere, which is in prison, possibly refers to the Byzantine era of the 8th century, when this place actually had a prison on it. The most interesting thing about this church is that it's built into the remains of three Roman temples from the Republican era, remains of which are clearly visible in the walls of the exterior as well as the interior and the subterranean area. So this is the idea. So you've got three temples next to each other and that's the original building that stands today. On the right hand side of the church as you face it was the temple dedicated to the god Janus dated to around 260 BC. The middle temple built between 197 and 194 BC the largest of the three, and its footprint corresponds almost exactly to the current church, was dedicated to Juno Sospita, or the preserver, and the third and smallest temple was dedicated to the goddess Spes, Hope. That one, they think, was built around the same time as the um, Temple of Janus. Six of its original 12 columns are clearly visible in the exterior wall of the church. Continuing our study of the early church, we also visited San Giovanna in Laterano, the original of which was the oldest papal basilica used for the first Lateran Council in AD 313. And I think this is also still the Cathedral of Rome. The central bronze doors are Roman originals from the Curia Iulia, or the Senate House in the Forum. The marble and bronze columns are said to have been taken from the Temple of Jupiter on the Capitoline Hill. The bronze columns in that temple had been recast from the bronze prows of Cleopatra's ships taken in battle by the Emperor Augustus. Some of the original decoration survives, but it's not in its original position. Um, the original building was burnt to the ground um, and has been rebuilt several times since then. But parts of the 4th century nave colonnade, now see if I can find these. So this red here. Um, is two granite columns from Aswan in southern Egypt. They're supporting the triumphal arch and flanking the altar of the Holy Sacrament are the four bronze columns which came from Cleopatra's ships, which came from the Capitoline. And then 24 green speckled Thessalonian marble columns flank the statues of the apostles in the nave. It's difficult to see it's those. And apparently they think there's some pilasters as well down the nave and they think there's actually Roman columns inside the pilasters as well. At the left end of the portico stands a Roman statue of Constantine the Great, which was taken from the Baths of Diocletian. However, remarkable though this church is and its interior, it pales in comparison with its successor, St. Peter's Basilica, where the sheer size and adornment of the church leaves you absolutely breathless. Ancient Rome is recalled in the soaring columns, arches, pediments, and extensive use of marble and gold, culminating in Bernini's Baldacchino, it's 927 tons of dark bronze was that that was removed from the Pantheon's roof and was taken in 1633. Standing 90 feet or 30 meters tall, its spiral columns derive their shape from the columns of the Baldacchino in the original St. Peter's Basilica, also built by Constantine, which legend has it came from Solomon's temple in Jerusalem. Cherubs are repeated throughout the monument, giving the overall effect of the Ark of the Covenant. So that's the one on the right. And it's unbelievably, I actually find it a little bit gary, but <laughs> it's very, very impressive. No visit to Rome is complete without a tour of the Vatican Museum, where there's a lot of appropriation on display, especially Raphael's rooms, which offer a unique perspective on the archaeology of appropriation. Not only did Raphael draw heavily on classical art and architecture, once again promoting the illusion of a new Rome, his use of chiaroscuro, a technique developed by ancient Roman sculptors to create contrasts between light and shade, adds to the dramatic effect. Furthermore, arches and domes punctuate the scenes, another invention from ancient Rome, 
and adapted to its symbolic renovation. In a more physical sense, the floor of the stanza is a beautiful swirling mosaic in marble, pillaged from ancient Roman buildings, presenting a multitude of colours with the large circular slabs of marble coming from ancient Roman columns, a common practice in this period. This is thanks to Wikipedia, because there's too many people when you're there. But you can see the big circles, the slivers taken out of Roman columns. Very sad. As the end of the course drew near, we visited the Esposione Universale Roma, or UR, Mussolini's planned town for the abandoned World Fair of 1942. It was very interesting to see his interpretation of classical architecture. And although this town seems stark and somewhat soulless compared with central Rome, his concept has to be admired. Emphasizing links between the Roman Empire and its own aggressive politics, Mussolini's fascist re regime had something in common with the ancient Romans, a penchant for erecting spectacular buildings. So this is classed as Mussolini's square Colosseum. Apparently this building has been standing empty for a lot of years and Prada, the fashion house, have just bought it. So. The day that we went there, as you can see, this is taken from the church, St. Peter and Paul, at the top of the road. It was torrential downpour. It was so heavy. These bottom photographs are not mine. <laughs> but we went into the museum, which is an extremely cold museum, and at the far end, there's a beautiful um, map, 3D map of ancient Rome, which is worth the visit just for that. And these, the entrance is incredible. It's Taller than the Pantheon, I think, when you go in. Enormous. Finally, we looked at various, pro various approaches for displaying the past, from contemporary museum displays to how the fascist propaganda machine used the Roman past in places such as the Arapakis Museum. And I just put this in because it's beautiful. In addition to these lectures, we were actually had ex a couple of extra things that we were fortunate to be allowed to do. One was to visit an archaeological site and the other was to visit a library built over a Roman villa. The archaeological site was the excavation of the Porticus Emilia in Testaccio. One of the archaeologists, Corinne Tetereau of the Royal Dutch Institute in Rome, escorted us round and while explaining what they had achieved, outlined the challenges associated with accommodating the heritage management needs of major ar archaeological sites alongside urban renewal projects in a densely populated area. Much of the ruins of this porticus are actually part of apartment blocks in the area. It's dated to the second century BC and was one of the largest buildings of the Roman Empire, 487 by 60 meters. And some of its mural remains still reach up to six meters in height. However, its function is unclear this one here. This is an artist's impression at the bottom of what it would have looked like. Um, there's a theory that it was a depot for housing the naval fleet. There's also a theory that it was just a distribution warehouse. So they haven't found any evidence of either yet. The library was the newly renovated Bibliotheca Herziana Max Planck Institute for Art History. And this is inside the Palazzo Zuccari. It wasn't due to be opened until the 1st of February of last year, and it's only accessible to students doing a higher degree by research, so we wouldn't have got in anyway. It was a real honor to get to be shown around. But the interesting thing is that the new library is enclosed within a historic palazzo, and the new basement is suspended from a cleverly engineered floating floor with Roman ruins underneath that. However, as with Rome, every time they find a Roman ruin. It was a challenge for them to be able to construct this new building within the confines um, of the protection of the cultural heritage. They couldn't alter the facade of the building at all, and they were further hampered once they discovered this villa, which dated to about 60 BC. So the team of engineers developed a statically bored construction and created a prototype for works of this nature constrained by archeological interest. The remains, um, of the late Roman villa thought to belong to Roman Senator Licinius Lucullus stand nine meters below Frederick Zuccari's garden and then underneath the second basement level of the new building. So they exposed the ruins. Here's, it took 10 years for them to 
do it all and excavated everything they possibly could prior to putting the new building in. A terrace-shaped wall decorated with mosaics, which was once part of the Nymphaeum, remains intact. And in addition, other small finds, there's a head of a marble statue of Venus. Um, this fountain was found in there. And these, were, these are actually hanging now in the walls of the library, but they were from the villa. Um, the foundations of the new building are now secured on 175 micropiles and rise above the archaeological site, but don't touch it at all. And you can actually go down and view it through a glazed gallery. So it's, it's visible. The ceiling frescoes in the entrance hall are original to the palazzo, and the view from the rooftop is unbelievable. They've got a courtyard with a cafe up there. It must be very hard when you're taking a break. <laughs> For me, the fascination of ancient Rome is that it continues to be renewed through this archaeology of appropriation. While it would be incredible to see the buildings of antiquity in their full glory, the commandeering of materials throughout the ages has created new histories, whether it be ruined temples incorporated into a Christian church, the Pantheon reconsecrated, its valuable materials reused in yet another church, or simply elements of ancient buildings requisitioned for new construction. We may lament this destruction, but much more may have been lost if not for the desire to renew the glory of ancient Rome. The art and architecture both reflects and incorporates its heritage, giving us marvellous buildings whose exquisite interiors would not be possible without this appropriation. Over the duration of the course, we visited, discussed, examined, admired, photographed, and received lectures on 2,000 years of the history of Roman art and architecture its preservation, conservation, recycling and reuse. It was incredible, fascinating, overwhelming, enriching and completely exhausting. <laughs> Thank you again to the Roman Archaeology Group for a very generous scholarship, allowing me the opportunity to take part in this course. The benefits will last far longer than the blisters and aching legs. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rebecca. I mean, there, there are two obvious aspects of that talk that Rebecca's just done. The, the, the first is that she claimed to be very nervous before she came down and that she hadn't eaten since Monday or something of that sort. <laughs> but but, but I, I, I thought she did a... You, you wouldn't have thought it from the very confident presentation she's just given us and you know, how enlightening it all was. So you're well done and thank you very much. You know, you're a very... <laughs> And as we often do, a bottle of wine for you to help get over, get over your nerves this evening. Uh, but the, the second aspect, of course, is the content of what Rebecca has just been telling us. So if you've got any questions at this stage for her or for me for the first part, this is, this is your opportunity you know, to see just how deep her knowledge actually is. <laughs> Or, or well, that's one of those veneers that I was talking yeah. about of you know, Roman marble on top of brick and... Uh, yeah. I'm just kidding, of course. <laughs> the last building? Which one? This one? Yeah. That's the... Um, Castel Sant'Angelo? Castel Sant'Angelo and Hadrian's... Castel Sant'Angelo? Yeah. And it's Hadrian's burial place. So I think. And then that's the museum, Capitoline Museum. Capitoline Museum. I have no idea what this building is. It's just big and round. <laughs> and I think this is that the, it's the Forum. So, so, suppose Temple of Venus. Temple of Venus. It's yeah. It's just forward. outside the um, Santa Maria in Cosmodon, I think. So we saw these every day as well. It was very. This building especially was very close to our hotel. Uh, any other questions? Yeah. Uh, in your photograph of the uh, Pantheon, yep. and, and in some of the images that David showed us, you, in, in whatever that facing is, mm. it's full of little square 
poles. Yeah. Are they for attaching facing of marble, are they? Yeah, marble. And I think they thought there was um, some um, sculpture in that, in the uh, triangle as well. Okay. So, yeah, when I first saw that, I thought it was somebody who had been shooting at it. <laughs> but, gosh, I didn't think they could do this in the war. But, it, yes, it's where marble's been removed. It's little holes where it was wedged in. Yeah. There, there were originally bronze letters for an inscription on the pediment as well. And... All the letters, of course, are gone, but on the basis of the holes and the pattern of them, some German scholars have very cleverly reconstructed what the letters probably were that required those particular holes and have re, you know, <laughs> reconstructed the entire inscription. Uh, it looks pretty convincing as well. It's, it's one of these tireless tasks that only German archaeologists seem to have the, 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 <laughs> the, the necessary skills for. Uh, anything else? Anybody got any other questions? Travis. Yeah, I think I think it's Grand Central, isn't it, in New York, that is mo modelled on the bus, the Caracalla. Um, it's the one that's still there. The one that used to be on top of Madison Square Gardens is. Is disappeared, but I think it is the one that still survives. Grand, Grand Central, I think, is the, the one modelled on the Baths of Caracalla. And I, I, there's one of the libraries is modelled on um, one of the great granaries in it Ostia. You know, so you have your appropriation across the Atlantic, you know, stealing the ideas and building major buildings in the, in the New World as well. Well, it, it's, it's believed, this is, uh, I'm basing all this on Janet Delane's very, very convincing study, uh, that the bulk of it was essentially done by the time he was assassinated. Yeah, so it, within a period of about five years, I mean, he was in Rome for the first year of his reign. Uh, probably they got things on their way then, but she's been able to date it on the basis of lots of these Roman bricks, they stamped them with the name of the maker and often the names of the people who were consuls that year. And since, you know, so you know when they were actually, which year they were being made, and she calculates as well that most brick making took place in a particular season of the year when you could get access to fuel easily and you run the kilns and so on. So she's able to date when she thinks the start of brick making that, for bricks that went into the substructure uh, were being produced, you know, when it starts, and she thinks the whole thing was essentially done during the you know, period of about five years. Uh, with further decoration following over a long period after that. So, so you would agree, I'm sure, that if we were to meet our own building deadlines, say for Elizabeth Key, all we need, all we need is donkeys and slaves. <laughs> <laughs> where, where, are we to, where are we to find those? <laughs> presumably, the sli the, presumably we rate pairs are the slaves. <laughs> uh, anything else? Any other questions? Uh, the, yes. Well, I mean, cu curiously, in the post-Roman period, once it had ceased to be a functioning bath building and the roof was being taken away, you know, the, uh, and the, the whole interior was then exposed, the, the grounds round about the bath building were used as a cemetery, uh, quite a considerable one, you know, right the way through the Middle Ages. You know, so, but you know, you're talking about people who died in the process of making the, the, the structure. Presumably, uh, you know, it's a sort of feat. Well, a, a lot of the workers would have been part of the urban population of Rome. Uh, they were pr quite possibly free inhabitants of the city uh, rather than slaves. Uh, there were people who lived in the tenement buildings you know, within a mile or so and uh, you know, who would have rocked up for work each day or they might have lived in the camps that would have been constructed around the quarries and where they were extracting the volcanic sand from and so on. You know, so the, you know, the numbers of workers would have been huge and it would have varied over time and varied as to where they were being uh, required. Where there was... Uh, yep. Yes, that's one of the other consumables, I suppose, I should have mentioned. You know, that... Yes, it's, it's an astonishing enterprise. You know, it would have been an extremely difficult thing to do in any period in history, but you know, given that 
you know, the, the Roman Empire wasn't as efficient as we like to think it was. I mean, it, been, it seemed a bit more like a third world country to us today. Uh, but nevertheless, they, they were astonishing, astonishingly successful in being able to organize something like that. Uh, you know, these presumably thousands of animals that were required every day, you know, to, as, you know oxen, docks, and donkeys, mules, and so on, as well as all the people, in making sure you didn't have uh, traffic uh, uh, you know, gridlock uh, in the narrow streets of Rome. So, very, very impressive. But you all know that or you wouldn't be here. Uh, anything else? Yes? It was there for about 300 years. Yes, the, 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 the comment the lady has made is about the standard of uh, construction and the amenities provided even in somewhere like the forts on the, the fringes of the Roman Empire in, in, in the north of Britain along Hadrian's Wall. And it is true as you go along all these forts on Hadrian's Wall every one of them has a bath building. Now these were not because the soldiers were Roman citizens. The soldiers in those forts on Hadrian's Wall were provincial soldiers. They were, you know, they, they were the local recruits. They were the Germans, the Spaniards, and so on, who were not Roman citizens. But they were nevertheless providing that amenity for them as a, you know, a bath, bath building. In that part of the north of England, it's much needed, of course. <laughs> I, I, mean, I mean a hot bath building. I, I, I don't mean hygiene. <laughs> Uh, the, the, the earliest Roman aqueduct goes back to the 300s BC um, and then they follow sort of fairly swiftly after that. The last major one is the one built by Trajan, uh, partly to supply his bath, bath buildings. And it's, it's the, the aqueduct of Trajan, as you've probably seen, because I think uh, uh, Mari would have circulated it. Um, or Nora has circulated it sometime in the last couple of years that they found where the aqueduct of the spring that supplies the aqueduct of Trajan uh, was located you know, well to the north of Rome. Uh, the aqueduct itself is, still supplies water to that huge ornamental fountain on the other side of the Tiber, just below where the American Academy is. I forget which uh, one it is. It's the sort of magnificent white marble fountain that's, and it's being supplied by the, the, the aqueduct of Trajan. And most of the, these ornamental fountains in Rome, you know, the better known ones, are still being supplied by Roman aqueducts that have been sort of brought back into use. Anything else before we... In that case, uh, it just remains for me to, to thank Rebecca again, who's obviously a very worthy <laughs> recipient of uh, our <laughs> fellowship. She, she very generously credited me with you know, some, some part in financing this. I just like, I, I think I'd better say that <laughs> it's, it's Don Boyer and all of you uh, through your contributions as members that have made it possible to fund these, uh, these scholarships. You know, it's, it's a good thing. Uh, we've already had two applications for the closing date, which is the 1st of April this year, and I'm told there's another couple in process. Uh, this year, because we had no applications last year, ironically, uh, we can give four of these travel scholarships if necessary. So I'm, I'm hopeful that we can give at least the two and possibly as many as four this year. So it'd be great if we can see more of our students going off and you know, doing the kinds of things that Rebecca has done. Thank you very much.